It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luden here with you live on Supply Chain Now Radio. Welcome back to the show. So like all of our series on Supply Chain Now Radio, you can find our replays on a wide variety of channels. Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever else you get your podcast from. As always, we'd love to have you subscribe so you don't miss anything. So real quick, we want to thank all of our sponsors that allow us to br- bring best practices and innovative ideas to you. Uh, from spend management experts to Verison, the Effective Syndicate, Vector Global Logistics, SupplyChainRealEstate.com, many more. You can check out our sponsors on the show notes of this page. So let's welcome in my fearless co-host, Mr. Greg White, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur, trusted advisor to many, esteemed guru to some. Wow, esteemed guru. <laughs> Is that a promotion? (laughs) It is. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, it's great to be here. Um, I love this new studio. I do too. Right. It feels like, it feels pretty homey, Um, you know, and uh, we got plenty of space here. I can hardly reach these guys across the table. (laughs) Yeah. And you're speaking about our two featured guests today. Yes. Let's talk about them. So Jonathan Townsley, Raj Verma, welcome to you both. Glad to have you here on Supply Chain Now Radio. Thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. You yeah, bet. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Yeah. And and it's been really interesting uh, learning more about their background. We were familiar with Jonathan. Jonathan has collaborated with us on a previous webinar that was really well received a few months back when it was about 170 degrees here in yeah. Atlanta, <laughs> uh, all about uh, procurement and, and uh, procurement leadership and whatnot. And then, uh, Jonathan, you brought Raj here today. And we, as we come to find out, Raj... He's a radio guru. He's a guru. Yes. Yeah. And did a yeah. radio show in Atlanta on, on sports, yeah. right? Co- uh, collegiate athletics. Yeah, football. college football. Okay. And uh, so this is going to be, y'all are both going to fit right in. I'm looking forward to, to getting the getting the secrets on, on y'all friendship. <laughs> <laughs> so, but before we get there, Jonathan and Raj, and then today to our audience, we're going to talk a lot about uh, the ever-evolving world of procurement and procurement leadership, some of the best practices, some of the initiatives that both these gentlemen are leading uh, to help organizations um, get better and change the way they do business yeah. and, and, and engage your supply chain base and really just get thought leadership on, on, on the space in general. So looking forward to that. But before we get there, we've got some interesting news stories to lead off with. We're bringing back um, out of the closet some of the top things known in supply chain now. Right, Greg? That's correct. And we're going to lead off. Back by popular demand. Yes. Right? I've had two lunches in the last two days where people said, where are my three top things for the day? <laughs> well, yeah, and sometimes it was three. Sometimes it was 17. And, right. You know, today it'll be three. It's going to be three. That's right. Because we've got to give the people what they want. That's yes. right. That's what we do. <laughs> Absolutely. I like that. All right. So lead story. Uh, news was made last week. Uh, IBM yeah. announced a big development in the blockchain space. Uh, according to Computer World, Big Blue announced last week. Uh, that they're launching IBM Sterling Supply Chain Suite. So, Greg, as you may know, this service is built on the foundation of Sterling B2B Network and the Sterling Order Management. Right. And amongst other things, it enables real-time order tracking and shipment optimization. Um, and, but, you know, one other quick note, uh, when IBM acquired Red Hat, you know, uh, six months ago, eight months, whenever that was, mm-hmm. I f- we figured that there's something really big in the right. works, right? You don't, th- that's, right. A, that's not a, any small move. So this seems to be one of the big projects that might come out of that acquisition. I think, it, you know, they're going after a $50 billion market. And and to do that, they they have products that were previously branded and delivered independently, IBM blockchain, IBM Watson supply chain, um, and then their IoT offerings. They've brought that all under the Sterling banner to create one integrated tool set for addressing that. So big companies will have a place to go where they can leverage all of those things. So all of those previously marketed and delivered separately, I'm sure they can still be delivered separately, but those as a toolkit is a, is really, really powerful. It's good to see Big Blue, mm. right? I mean, you, they're still one of the biggest companies in the entire world, but yeah. it, that you don't hear about them because they're 
I think their CEO still wears a suit, so <laughs> we don't talk about CEOs <laughs> like that, right? No, no mock turtleneck. Yeah, right. They don't they're, have a mock turtleneck or or a purple uh, rain T-shirt. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they're busy making business happen, right? Yeah, globally. I mean, there you go. And and they are a great solution for the biggest of the big. And um, you know somebody. Uh, you know, who, who could have greater resources in terms of science and technology to be able to pull all these technologies together? Yep. Right. So it, it, it was it's funny, though, you mentioned, you know, the IBM, the culture, right? You have yeah. the culture with the suits. So I think one of the reasons that are kind of behind the scenes is in this new age of millennial apps and fast moving, they want to mm -hmm. be projecting that they have a number of smaller firms that are moving at a much quicker pace than just the old IBM yeah. or the old GE or the old Westinghouse. It's just that perception in the marketplace now. Yeah, Good yeah point. you're right. And, but the, and they are making things happen yes. for the big players in yep. the marketplace. Well, let's, let's, let's hear from one uh, research director uh, for IDC and, and, and Simon Ellis's take on this, on this development. So he, he went on to say how uh, IBM is not unique in offering the, a multi-tenant cloud network for supply chains, but the company obviously has advanced AI and blockchain as components of the service more so than other vendors, right? Uh, and he also was quoted as saying, quote, I think companies can leverage this with some other supply chain apps that they already have. So they don't need to rip and replace stuff. Right. The value of any blockchain will be square of the number of users it has. So how you make those connections is really important. And this certainly moves it forward, end quote. And, and he was alluding to, uh, as they made some of these acquisitions, that they're gaining a ton of users that, of course, powers the rest of the network. So it'll be really inter interesting to see where IBM, what's next for the Sterling yeah. Suite. Sterling had a massive following even before IBM yeah. bought them, right? I mean, they were a major, major yes. player in terms of OMS and and B two B marketplaces. So, you know, they are they are doing the right thing. I, that's you know, you agree with I, Simon? I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't agree. I, I think I think that, I think that there it, it is proven every day. If you ever watch sports, that that um, IBM's predominant solution is AI, not even blockchain. Blockchain's relatively commoditized these days. Mm. And um, and there are lots of ways to approach it. I mean, mm. literally open source ways to approach it. Um, but when you blend the advanced AI that, that IBM has and the other business problems that they can solve and the way that they can integrate that into solving those business problems as well, it's hard to match. Mm. I, I mean, I, I'm pretty well versed in what's available out there from a from a supply chain technology standpoint yeah. and this puts them i think head and shoulders above well so quick programming note there on that last sentence you just shared you're gonna be kicking off a new technology focused yeah. series here yeah. on supply chain radio yeah where, where everyone will get to learn exactly what i know so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna explore the, the boundaries of my knowledge maybe <laughs> a, a vulcan mind meld yeah, yeah exactly yes. mm -hmm. well we're looking forward to that uh as, as we all know sitting here at the table technology uh, supply chain doesn't happen these days without this a heavy emphasis yeah. on technology and this is really a neat development and we'll see where it goes from here but you've got a couple other stories yeah a couple up of your sleeve couple interesting stories um september retail sales were up depending on how you compare it i love when we get uh statistics as as the great mark twain said there are lies damn lies and then there are statistics um so depending on how you compare it <laughs> depending on how you compare it um retail sales were up 4.1 percent against the previous month august um and or off uh three tenths of a percent so uh, sorry, off three tenths of a percent compared to August, but up over September of last year. So um, a little bit of a mixed signal, which we seem to be getting from a lot of things in the marketplace. I mean, I think people think things like the the stock market is down, but it hit another record uh, earlier this week. People think we have a, uh, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the transportation recession, which is true. Um, I, you know, that that's undeniable, but at the same time, it's more of, as I think we talked to the president of uh, Roadrunner Freight, right? Yes. Um, you know, it's more of a excess capacity because they built expecting the same capacity that they had in 2018, and 2018 was a boom year. So mm -hmm. we're still getting a lot of, uh, of mixed signals in terms of the economy here. I don't know. I mean, 
I think uh, retailers, what I've read is that retailers believe that this year's peak season will be higher than last year. Definitely. In, in around three, in around the three to four percent range. Yep. And we, we it, and, and uh, there's a majority of analysts that agree and they are predicting that. We've covered that in previous shows. So that's good news. And we all need good news, right? Any- I love I love it when analysts predict things as Raj knows, having been in the sports world, there's nothing better than being a predictor of things because you're never held accountable. For exactly. It. You can move off unless right. your money's out there. Right? Right. No, but it's interesting because I know we're going to an election year and this is not about a political discussion. But, you know, with the current turbulence within the trade discussions that are happening and the intersection of the election. Right. And then you're taking a look at some of the tariff deals. That's a unique prop unique time that we're living through and then you know we'll probably talk about it later but i i spend usually my fourth quarter talking number number of cpos and cfos in terms of their cash management going into next year who's holding on to cash who's not right and as we're all aware the biggest thing is turbulence and versus being the status quo having that equilibrium effect yeah and, and sometimes they don't care who's in office and what's being done as long as they can forecast 12 to 18 months out. So yeah. I think to, for us, it's how stationary the markets and what's coming out of DC is over the next three to six months. We'll get a good gauge of what 2020 will look like. Yeah. Excellent commentary. Well put. Um, Jonathan, any other comments around the, the season? And, and or you want to break out your crystal ball and give us your prediction since there's no one's held accountable, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, tell I, us I've, what I've you... never been successful in any of those <laughs> types of predictions, so I just stay away from it and let, let you experts take care of it. Thank that. you very <laughs> much. Mm-hmm. Let us embarrass mm-hmm. ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> well, hey, so he's, it depends. Are you shorting? Or are you, yeah, which yeah. way? Are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. the one making money. Exactly. We're the one making We're, words. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. So you let off that segment with one of your favorite Mark Twain quotes. My favorite Mark Twain quote is a man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn in no other way. You know, I, think, I think we've all been there. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so he's clearly carried a cat by the tail. He's learned not to not to make predictions. Yeah, I made a visit to Hannibal and, and saw the uh, Mark Twain estate and, and uh, learned uh, quite a few of those quotes. So, yeah. Those, yeah. yeah. That, but that's one I hadn't heard, so I'll, I'll remember that. Please do. <laughs> it is so universally uh, applicable, I have found. So, yeah. but especially as an entrepreneur, Greg, I have one more. Yeah. So you know that we we really believe in sustainability in um, in the supply chain, and we like to promote that as much as we can. Additionally, to quote one of our Supreme Court justices, I like beer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so so I saw this article and I thought it was fantastic. Carlsberg and a, yeah. a delicious Danish beer. Um, is debuting a sustainable paper bottle. So how about that? Mm. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, I eat it. I eat at Ted's a lot, and they use sustainable paper straws. And yeah. instead, I've just learned to drink like a grown up from the edge of the glass because <laughs> I can't stand it. <laughs> Uh, I'm an accidental environmentalist. I don't really use straws so, since I'm 12. So, so you're going to pilot that beer and tell us about uh, you it? Know what paper I think bottle. It, it's going into prototype, so obviously they've got some work to do. For the um, record, we will prototype any beer that anyone would like to send yeah. us. We will yeah. officially taste it and get you back uh, feedback. Yeah. Right. So, um, Super. They have two different prototypes, one's lined and one's unlined. So they're going to, um, but, but even the lined one is lined with recyclable materials. So, wow. um, you know, again, the Danes leading the charge in terms of uh, innovation in, in sustainability. Mm. So they love doing that. It's, you know, I mean, it, it is. They are on the outer edge of all things sustainability. So uh, fantastic that they do that. And I can't think of a better beer. Yes. I can't think of a, a, a better, better excuse <laughs> To drink Carlsberg beer. So, will they be unveiling this in Davos? Uh, that, maybe. That's maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> there be DR uh, summit, right? <laughs> so they, they, they have not set a date for release yet, mm. um, but they are, uh, you know, it's part of their ongoing initiative. Well, paper bottles, maybe they can fax us some beers mm. with this new. Does that work like that? Uh, what's a fax machine? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a carrier pigeon? I don't know. Yeah. Pony Express, right? Yeah. Drone? Yes. All right. Uh, anything else from the news desk? And Mr. Greg White. What more could we need That's after right. that? Wrap it with beer. Yeah. Um, well, we've got two very interesting guests here today. I'm looking forward to diving into their personal journeys and their and, and their thought leadership and the insights on, yeah. on really not just procurement, but, but uh, supply chain, the, the greater supply chain in general. 
Um, so we're going to start, Jonathan Townsley, as we want to kind of paint a picture for our, our audience of, of our, our guests. Tell us more about yourself and your, your personal and your professional journey. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I'm Jonathan Townsley, and uh, I come from the uh, the great city of St. Louis, uh, but I've lived uh, everywhere uh, throughout the world, uh, thanks to some great opportunities I've had with large companies like Ingersoll Rand and Eaton, and even working with some smaller companies uh, you know, based out of St. Louis and elsewhere. So I've, I've been able to uh, meet other people from other cultures, uh, learn how they're, they're doing business, and mm. uh, enjoy their food, enjoy their drink, which is uh, always great. Uh, I come from a, a bit of a diverse background in that uh, yeah, I, I have a Russian wife, uh, so we, we get to go to uh, Russia quite a bit, which is always great, especially if you, if you like vodka and if you like uh, history. I mean, it's a, it's a great historical culture. Beautiful um, architecture. Yeah, absolutely uh, impressive and, and, and fantastic. Uh, I actually was raised in uh, uh, sort of a, a mixed household. My, my father of uh, Serbian descent, uh, mother of Lebanese descent, so we got a lot of great food in, in the house. Uh, but we, we always had, uh, you know, some super staples like White Castle. And, and, <laughs> and you know, thank you for supporting Wichita, <laughs> Kansas. Yes, yeah, you, you can't uh, you can't really go uh, without that. That's that's a must. So, uh, but I really uh, have enjoyed uh, where where procurement and, and supply chain is going now, and uh, it's really helped me to uh, get closer to to my global roots mm. and uh, to meet more people. And, and help them succeed. So it's it's been a fun time. Mm. And currently, uh, you're doing a lot of consulting with a variety of companies out there, right? Yeah. Uh, for the past uh, year now, I've been working on uh, various consulting assignments in the uh, financial tech space, in the retail space. Mm. Uh, and what I've learned, even though these are different industries, I, I've learned that the, the people uh, that are going through procurement change and procurement initiatives, uh, they really want to find new ways of doing business, mm new ways of creating value hmm. and getting closer not only to their uh, customers, but also uh, yeah, helping their, their employees and their team members uh, learn and to grow so that they could ultimately uh, do better themselves. Love that. Hey, can I ask, uh, just for our listeners, can I ask just a really foundational question? So give us your definition of procurement. Uh, you know that you know that it gets it off <laughs> it often gets mixed up with purchasing or sometimes inventory planning and replenishment. So get, I, I just like to make sure everybody's on clear footing here. Yeah. So you, people ask me that all the time, and uh, they say, "Well, what is, what is supply chain? What is procurement?" And the first thing they say, "Are are you sending out a purchase order?" I said, "Well." Hey, I, I, I have done that before. Uh, and they asked me, are you moving something in a warehouse? I said, well, I've done that too, but that's really not what it is. Actually, it's about change, mm. uh, especially in today's business. It's, it's doing something outside of what you normally would do, uh, sending those purchase orders and, and moving uh, a piece of material from point A to point B. It really is getting closer to your customer, getting closer to your teammates, figuring out what's important to them mm -hmm. and helping them to execute it. Yeah. Love that. Love that. You know, I think it's so important to keep a broad, you can't pigeonhole things, especially in the end of supply chain these days. And especially with the role that procurement leaders have globally, right? Um, every organization out there, especially in the, in, in the retail space, which one of the sectors you mentioned are looking for ways to get more value out of their, their end to end supply chains and, and, and a progressive view and procurement, like kind of what you just laid out there is so critical, right? It, it's not about doing business the same way we're doing it in 1962 or 1992 even, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I took that away from our webinar that you, that, that you were featured on and, and really great to have you in the studio sharing the same perspective. So let, let's switch gears here, uh, Raj Verma. Let's, let's dive into more about your personal and, and professional background. I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. You bet. Greg, really appreciate being here. Great to hear Jonathan. So after hearing Jonathan's exploits, I feel like, God, I've never moved anywhere. <laughs> Thank you for making me feel that. Next time, Scott, please introduce me first. <laughs> That's right. I almost feel like I'm boring. Like, boring people yeah, first. Yeah, boring. I'm like the I-75 kid. Grew up in Michigan, spent a stint in Ohio, then went down to Florida for grad school. Kept moving south, and I realized I-75 ends in the ocean, so I had to start moving north. Uh, did a stint in D.C. and now in Atlanta. Um, my path in the 
corporate career world is kind of take on many, many different junctures. And for all you kids listening, there's more than one way to get ahead. So (laughs) even though your parents are telling you to go to Yale or Harvard or Princeton, trust me, you can go many ways. So uh, ironically, I was in real estate back in the early 90s. So really different path, you know, but cut my teeth in real estate in home building. Market tanked. I was in central Ohio. So what do you do? You start opening up business books. What? It, somehow I got into, there was a small company called MCI. You guys may have heard about it. That was going through some <laughs> troubles and ran into somebody who wanted to kick off a telecom splinter company that was going to potentially do uh, uh, get into online. We didn't even know what online was. And they said, hey, can you do marketing? I said, okay, sure. That led to going into business school. So when I got into business school, I always had the thought to get into consulting, you know, take a look at like a McKinsey, a Boston Bay, and hey, get out there, change the world. And then there's this thing called Six Sigma mm, yeah. that a guy by the name of Jack Welch had usurped from Motorola. I can say that now since I don't work for Jack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody works for Jack right now. No, yeah. exactly. I gotta be careful. I know he might be still be yeah, yeah, but that doesn't mean his reach is gone. <laughs> <laughs> so You've been added to the list. Yeah, yeah you're right on the on. list. Yeah. Trust me, he yeah. does have a list yeah. like Sheldon, right? I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so... I, I signed up for this thing called Six Sigma, not knowing what it was other than, you know, derivation from the mean. And so I was in the GE Six Sigma program and they said, hey, how would you like to go to Fort Myers, Florida and deal with something called freight logistics? So I'm like, OK, I don't know what supply chain, <laughs> freight logistics and Six Sigma, all three things I'm learning by the fly. So uh, yeah. so that was my entree into this world. So I ran freight uh, logistics and negotiations with a number of the largest f- carriers and for every mode you can imagine for GE for a while. And what I learned is I thought I was a great negotiator, but the reality is you got this you know, 500 pound wrecking ball behind you. Mm, right. And we could give offline discussions on how those negotiating <laughs> events went. And somehow that brought me to Atlanta, to a GE here and running indirect. And, you know, from there I joined one of my, uh, my suppliers in the early 2000s to help build a BPO, then a managed service practice within supply chain. And then just recently, um, from that uh, majority company, Metasys, we launched a spinoff startup called GoProcure. And very excited that a number of us ex-procurement guys got in. And we saw a gap in the marketplace, and we'll probably talk about this later specifically, as it relates to spend management and getting more suppliers to the table. So we launched a, a tool that hopefully one day, Greg, I'll be honored. <laughs> Now, since we're in the town, that if if, if you'd give us uh, your, your feedback on it, but basically yeah, sure. it's focused on the tail at the Fortune 500 level, and it's to mitigate risk, you know, from that standpoint, and we can get into more details later, but we've been doing for about three to four years, and f- that has taken me now from where I was on the other side, you know, yeah. being with corporate America, now being a, a, a supplier, a consultant, an advisor to a lot of the firms. and. Right. Uh, and from a personal perspective, uh, it, it's it, even though it's allowed me to move around our headquarters is here. So my family is centered here and, uh, um, you know, growing up uh, in Atlanta and uh, they're they're hardcore uh, Braves and Bulldog fans. So they're a little upset this week, I can say. Yeah. Rough week. Yeah. Rough week. Mm. <laughs> yes. Rough week. Well, um, and, and of course, Jonathan is a cards fan. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. But you know what? He was he was very gracious. He was. He was the, huge. very gracious, are, are almost the, are apologetic. Are the cards Thank still you. playing, by the way? Oh, uh, wow. no, they, they were uh, put out of their misery. <laughs> yeah. Well, he very gracious. And, and we'll hear what he was in the studio earlier this week, and he yeah. was also very yeah. gracious. But, hey, yeah. um, tis the season, right? Yeah. yeah. Moving to the World Series. So, Raj, so go procure. Uh, yeah. when, when did y'all launch the platform? So, the platform was launched 2016. And we were, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's a fine line between spinoff and startup, right? Mm-hmm. So just kind of give you a little bit of background. Metasys, which is a technology services provider that also offered all of a sudden, because of me and a few others, we started getting into the procurement supply chain mm-hmm. space, mm-hmm. you know, because of our relationships with a number of the firms. And we started going down spend management and providing advising services, then full suite of strategic sourcing. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, there's this gap in the market specifically on tail spend that's nobody's touching. And I have relationships with the large players, SAP, Oracle, Ariba, Coupa, and all of them. We're going to get to it 18 months. We're yeah. going to get to it 18 months. We're going to get to it 18 months. We go at this pace. I'm going to be, I'll be retired by the time you guys get to it. So 
took some seed money from the parent and some other investors and a few CPOs got together and said, hey, there's nobody doing this. There's nobody doing wing to wing tail management. So launched our platform. We uh, have gone live with a number of Fortune Fives and a few private equities. We roughly have three and a half billion SKUs on it. And it does both product and service. Three and a half B billion, billion. As in Bezos. Mm. As in yes, yeah. Bezos. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so define tail define, for us. I'll give you the business terminology because okay. tail has many definitions in the Webster Dictionary, and we won't go there. <laughs> So tail spend. This is not a sports show. You can't get away with it. Go ahead. I can't get away with talking about Danish beer earlier and swinging cats. Go ahead. So, so tail spend, as defined by chief financial officers and chief procurement officers, yeah. is that part where 90% of your traditional suppliers make up roughly 10 to 20% of your spend. So if you take a look okay. at a growth curve, yeah. mm-hmm. because the traditional focus in Fortune 5s, and we can even go further, Global 2000s, is their strategic partners. Mm-hmm. Those ones that focus on providing the goods and services to help me get my product out the door, right? Yeah. If you take a look at J- GM, as we're both favorite, favorite right. about Detroit right. area, they know down to the incremental penny that's in that car. Right. I mean, the, yeah. whether it's a Chevrolet, a Corvette, whatever they have, they know down to the penny. But then you start getting into the MRO to build it, the factory floor, their operations, then the thousands of dealerships they have in the different locations. You know, you got landscaping, you got janitorial, you got facilities, you got IT, you got marketing, advertising, you have all these things. And what traditionally happens is in a decentralized environment, even in when you're as strategic as you're trying to be and you've added suppliers in your supply chain, hey, businesses are more nimble out there these days. They have great ideas and great products, but they don't have the time to work with the centralized procurement office and the internal line of business doesn't. So what happens, and it's no fault of our own. I want to be very right. careful what I'm saying. It's not a malicious thing when we talk about leakage or Maverick spender tail. Mm-hmm. It's just the nature where water flows. It's the easier path. Yep. So if I'm sitting in the headquarters office, I'm not making cars and I need to go out and get a new marketing agency. We've acquired a business and I can't find somebody that's got the right price or the right type of agency relationship, I might just pick up the phone, give my purchasing card, boom, I've added that supplier. Mm. Or I might be sitting in LA, I'm a dealership. I've got a new dealership I've opened up. I need 50 new employees. What do I do? I can't get the hold of the guy in Detroit mm. to find out who can supply me here. I pick up the phone and call John down the road. He gets 50 people here. Yeah. What happens over time? I've added 100,000 suppliers mm. that have not been strategically vetted Right. Mitigation of risk. Think about those two things in yeah. today's environment. Costs are important, you know, and it happens. And I've done so many uh, advisories where somebody might be in company ABC as a strategic contract, but when they're all over the platform, all over the country, they're charging premium pricing. And then when you have people who don't have contract, you're paying 50% more. So the struggle for CFOs is from their standpoint is risk. And in a yeah. global environment where we're going today, and I was at a risk forum just recently talking to legal and CFOs is that, you know, you'll hear some people saying, yes, we are strategically sourcing. We have one single source. That's a disaster. Right. And then if you have a thousand suppliers and you haven't managed risk because that vendor can go out of business anytime. Mm. Have Mm. you seen their finances Mm. or, you know, talking discreetly, we could be dealing with some countries that have certain regulations and due to their relationship with the United States, you can't work with. Right. And they're part of the supply chain and we're not even aware of it. So the tail is that mixture of risk as well as hundreds of thousands of suppliers haven't been properly vetted that we address. Mm. Yeah. And through our solution, we make sure that we're dealing with compliance, risk and cost savings. And then the final takeaway, which we can talk about later, is how do we provide innovative suppliers into that mix? And they kind of represent the changing demographics of the United States. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah. So it, it's it all of that occurs for your top suppliers, not so much with these smaller, the, yeah, smaller yeah. Yeah. That, that provide a, a menu of services or, yeah. or or the menu of services that a, that a company needs. And as it's cast about the country or the or the world, you 
naturally lose control over that. Mm, exactly. Yeah, that's great to get a get a grasp on that. And I think also what Raj made a very good point about was the the risk and the innovation. Oftentimes, again, procurement is looked at as, yeah, how do we communicate our orders to the supplier? But uh, it's that uh, neglected piece that could really, uh, you know, come up and, and bite you and, and really uh, cripple your operations. So mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's very important. Well, yep. it's, not, it's not just financial risk. There's real oh. technology risk there. I mean, when, when Target got, got hacked, it was through their vendor network, mm. and they had not done sufficient vetting on that vendor you know, in, in their cybersecurity. No, that's a great point. You know, CISOs traditionally look at what's coming in right in front of them, but they don't, aren't paying attention to their existing customer and supplier relationship networks. Yeah, right. So I, I want to shift gears here. And, and Jonathan, uh, one of some of the conversations we've had is about elevating the procurement function. And that, that really, uh, some of the leading experts that put their hands on a lot of things we just described, right? right. A lot of things that Raj and-, and That and, doesn't and enunciate why. Absolutely. Right? I don't know what does. Great point. Um, but- Let's any additional why to that first, and then secondly, the second part of the question is is how are we how do we go about doing that Ra- raising the visibility of, you know, the, the procurement function in the end-to-end supply chain. Well, I think it, it kind of goes back uh, traditionally. We've always thought of uh, procurement or, or purchasing just as the uh, you know, maybe the uh, offensive line. Uh, so it's a kind of a, a thankless job. Uh, we just you know, do, do what we're told, uh, execute it, that's it, and, and, and go home. Uh, but uh, over the last 20 years or so, really, uh, the focus has changed. It's, it's more, how do you get involved with your teammates? Mm. How do you understand what it is that they need, what they value? And a lot of times, uh, what I've seen and found is that it's not always a cost reduction. Uh, sometimes it is. Yeah, how do we make sure that there's less risk in our supply chain? Mm. How do we make sure we're, we're getting very good ideas regarding innovation and uh, technology development from our suppliers? Mm. Uh, maybe we need to put together a, a conference or a council and, and invite those suppliers in to give us the ideas. Mm-hmm. So that's really where I think uh, the whole procurement function is headed. As, as part of the overall global supply chain. Do you, do you all feel that um, there's more and more, so the manufacturing organizations that, that I've served in, you know, when we're going after a certain business, we kind of bring the team in, the cross-functional team in to, to, to look at the bid or look at how we'd go about it or look at the components or whatever we had to do to successfully win the business and then make money at it. Do you all feel more and more that procurement is being involved in those conversations? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think it really comes from, from the top. You have to have... Uh, a visionary leadership team, a team that's not mired in the past, but one that's looking forward. And how are they creating value? How are mm-hmm. they finding value? How are they engaging uh, everyone that's involved in that value chain? So you really have to start at the top and, and understand uh, really what's the philosophy of the leadership mm-hmm. team and, and what they want to do uh, with their business. Raj? No, I, I firmly agree. And when you're talking about manufacturing, I asked the question, is somebody making their product organically? Are they not working with people? And that's where procurement comes to the table, right? I mean, you, you, Jonathan brought a great point. It's about innovation. And I always say, focus on your core and enhance that. And then let everybody else work with who your best partners are. I don't even call them suppliers. They should be thought of as strategic partners who you bring in to innovate. Those ones that are going to help you from a manufacturing sector. Because now, I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, how much stuff is made in the United States for the last 25 years? You know, it's gone to China and other places. So you have a very large supplier pool. Your procurement team has to be fully aligned with your line of business person at the manufacturing level or service level. So you guys are finding that best partner. And to your, to your Jonathan made a great point. You know, one of the th- weaknesses historically has been we're going to focus on price. Mm. Well, what is that? No, I want the best possible quality and the best possible service, and then we'll discuss the commercial terms in a long-term relationship. Yep. And maybe in my arrangement, I'm going to fo- have you focus on innovation. Mm. So you're bringing me product that's going to help generate further top-line growth and better bop- bottom-line growth for me. So let's stay right here. and Let's talk about, I like how you, you it's not suppliers, they are partners. Uh, and the best partners are bringing you know, a lot more value to the table than just 
this part for this price. Um, let's get y'all's thoughts on how you see not just procurement leaders, but organizations in general better uh, and then more effectively engaging their supply base to, 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 to really bring more value for everybody to the table. Uh, first, I'll start off by saying, uh, you know, we call these uh, yeah, partners a lot of terms, vendors, uh, suppliers, uh, ultimately partners. I, I personally depends on the day of the week yeah. depends yeah. on the day of the week, depends mm-hmm. on the person. I personally hate the, the word vendor to me. That's somebody that sold me a hot dog or yeah. a bag of popcorn once yeah. at a game. Uh, I like to think of it just as Raj said, uh, more of a, a longer term relationship. Uh, so that that would be at least a supplier. Uh, but I think more so a partner real quick so so to our audience that may not understand the con nothing against the hot dog but we love our hot dogs but you're talking about the transactional nature where yes, it's that yeah. one transaction and you never see them again that's it right yeah that's i don't what think that, any hot dogs were harmed in the filming of this <laughs> <laughs> and that's what that's what vendor implies that's what you're speaking to right that's right that's yeah. right so uh, when i engage with with anybody i really like to think you know what what it is that they can do uh for me not only now of course that that's always the start but I like to look into the future. What what can they do? Yeah. Uh, what are we asking them to do? Uh, so really, I, I like to en- engage my suppliers and learn about them. What are their capabilities? What are they thinking about uh, towards the future? What are their teams like? Mm. Uh, do they have uh, ongoing investment to to train their staff uh, to get them really involved in 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 current technology, uh, developing technology? Mm. It's it's much more than just producing a, a service or or producing a part. Yeah, well put. No, I, I echo those sentiments. You know, I'll kind of give a real life example than what I'm seeing now. So about 20 years ago, I think we were ahead of the curve, and that was mainly because of Welsh was pushing. And I'm just going to drop a couple names. Bob Nardelli, the old CEO for Home Depot, was right. my CEO, GE Power. And my CPO at that time was John Campy. John Campy was a leader in thinking about supplier relationship management. We would bring all our global suppliers into Atlanta and focus on what are you looking at three and five years out mm-hmm. that's going to help grow your company and what's that best product that you can provide us that's going to help change our top level growth. We would have our top engineers there who are pre- build, building turbines and gas engines and water technology and it would be an unbelievable brainstorming event because the reality is that when you're so much focused on getting other new suppliers and new customers you're losing the the talent base that's already in there that that you got that you can consume so I thought we did a fantastic job and I've seen a lot of fortune companies continue to do that supplier relationship management five days six seven days sessions what I'm seeing now which I really like uh, you know and I think it was taken from the venture the VCs out in the Silicon Valley and I mean, you should probably you're probably very aware of this and then fintech got on it and I see a number of banks they've started their own innovation accelerators right? right and the whole thought process is there i go out and take my existing suppliers or anybody new and i go listen we're ca- kicking this off we want you guys to come with just total great greenfield yeah whatever thought you have it can be as crazy as is what does the projected top line look like what do you stakeholders how much investment do you need and you come in and we will gr- bring you our cfo our c staff we'll give you our technologists we'll sit in a room we'll shortlist this they give pitches and then we'll choose the top three and then if it's a generated revenue for me Great. If it's not, I've exposed you to potential other customers and other partners. Right. And that type of thinking is what's going to lead those companies faster in their sectors yep. because they're partnering. They're thinking of unique ways to get out there. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I think back to the old days when I was actually in in industry and how many times I went to a vendor and said, hey, I need this. And they said, yeah, no problem. And I'm like, well, why didn't you offer that before? <laughs> exactly. You didn't ask. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, it's, it, you know, I think, no. it, I think the onus is on the purchasing organization to, to create this dynamic, right. To, to enable the suppliers, partners, whatever, to, to bring ideas. Right. I, I worked when I, um, left, um, well, when I started my company, it was mostly consulting, and I worked with a company called Henry Shine, and we did a tremendous evolution of their purchasing and procurement processes, and we did it by really deeply engaging the suppliers, right? Yeah. And, you know, look, uh, you know, there are lots of cliches around this, but the, the truth is everyone can win, right? I mean, 
I don't see compromise as everyone losing. I see compromise as everyone winning to the extent that they can. Well, and that's I think that's that is what you're describing there is how successful modern modern day successful organizations in this environment are looking yeah. at their their supply chain. Yeah, right? and it takes a level of transparency that until that until probably the 2000s was not natural. Even in the early 2000s was not natural. I mean, I did initiatives in Europe where it was clearly not natural. Mm. I mean, we had the same vendor have totally different deals with France versus Spain yeah. versus England, et cetera. And, and to bring that together and create that level of transparency was transformational. It, it really was. And, and that's what you are really promoting is engage the vendors as a partner, let them help you make money and you can help them make money. There's enough waste in the, in, in the market, in industry, that we, if all we do is help each other eliminate waste on each side, then then everyone can win and nobody is hurt. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I want to change gears again here and as we kind of move into the final segment of the interview, because I want to go a little bit broader. There's so much we could dive into this um, this kind of this procurement supplier focused partner focused. I want to use the right words there too. conversation. But also, I'd love to get you all to weigh in on uh, kind of as you move broader into the global end in supply chain. What are some, mm -hmm. some other trends or issues or challenges that are have been on your radar more than others that you all find really compelling right now? Uh, for me, I, I see actually more uh, private networking and collaboration uh, amongst peers within the, the supply chain uh, function. Mm -hmm. uh, and a perfect example is right now I, I'm doing some, some volunteer work with a group called Procurement Foundry, and it has uh, some almost uh, 2,000 members globally. And really, it's great because uh, we're all from different industries, different backgrounds, and we're able to share ideas, what works, what doesn't work, uh, all sorts of so tips. Uh, so I, I see these private networks uh, coming to the table uh, that will really be beneficial, not only for the, the procurement or supply chain practitioner, but I think also uh, for, for the suppliers that those people deal with. Mm. Mm. So, so speaking at a macro level, we'll go 50,000 feet. Um, let's, go 50, let's go 55. 50 or 60. <laughs> so, you know, if we take even outside of supply chain. They are procurement the, guys. Yeah. <laughs> we are. I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, that's you right. You guys have been. Right. <laughs> He's good. Yeah, you're very good. I can't believe you had me raise my phone. <laughs> so, um, you know, you know, it's using your word cliche. You know, you always hear somebody say, God, we are at form unbelievable, transformative times. Well, we really are. The largest group of workers in this country mm -hmm. are retiring. Yeah. With the baby boomers. We're introducing a new group with Gen Z and millennial that have a different mind meld of how they do work. Yep. They're not going to work for somebody for 10 years, five years. And, you know, I, I see resumes all the time. Six months, three months, four months. So you have a different workforce coming in and a different workforce leaving. A massive shift from a demographic perspective, not getting into politics, but it's reality. Yep. So we're going to have a plurality in 20 years. So when you take a look at that, that kind of cross section is your customer base, your employee base, and your partner base. And innovation is under that foundation level because of what the millennials and VCs are bringing. So for those companies, and it's not just supply chain, but those companies at a C-suite level all understand that their customers have changed. Yep. Do my strategic partners emulate that? Mm. Do my employees from an inclusion and sustainability mm. emulate that? If they yeah. don't, you're going to fail. Yeah. yeah. You know, you always see this every five years, Fortune 5 comes up with their list of companies that were there 100 years ago. If you take a look at that list, the dynamic nature of people moving on and off is faster than ever. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you as somebody who worked at a company that was the first on the stock exchange mm -hmm. and up till 2005 was regarded as the number one, it, where have they gone? What yeah. kind of GE, you know, Westinghouse. And there's gonna be more and more companies, even these tech companies, if they're not paying attention, you know, there's a lot of studies being done that also they live in a homogenous bubble out there in the Bay Area. Yeah. And so I think supply chain will be impacted and procurement will be impacted. But I think coming back to what John was saying, if you don't bring the CFO, the CPO, your top strategic partners, your top customers in a room to figure this out, you are going to be gone yeah. because the nature of the millennials and what's going on in Latin America and Africa and Asia, this is a global 
world now, you know, no not to steal for Friedman, the world, it's not only flat, you yeah, know, it, right. it's flat and fast, right. right? So I think people have to keep up with that and it's how fast you can move. You don't have sit there. I know data science mm. is the ubiquitous term that everybody wants, but I'm like that data science, but we giving me a report tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Or, or the next hour. Yeah. 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 I like how you included inclus- inclusivity there. Um, you know, Jack Allen came on with he, he, a manufacturing and, and supply chain leader with Cisco, uh, yeah. one of the most uh, um, uh, sustainable, green, uh, one of the most admired companies globally, right? Uh, they got a big presence here in North Atlanta, and they have made a big push in recent years to make to ensure that their team is reflective of their customers, yeah. right? And you, you got to be in this. This might sound real just uh, naive, but but if we don't make a deliberate effort at doing that, it doesn't happen. It doesn't, it doesn't happen because human, you know, some of the human natures that we've talked about in previous shows, um, and that is so important. I mean, as you describe the global world that we live in, and the changing demographics, and and how you know we're all different, we have different preference preferences. We've got to be willing to accept these different preferences, adjust how the company does business. It doesn't it doesn't you know, not not from a success failure standpoint, not compromising, but you've got to be able to be flexible in terms of how we enable others to be successful, right? Yeah. That's well, the, so not same. not only is it the right thing to do, but it but it's you're also going to get your ass kicked if you don't. I mean, totally. There, the the consumers out there are aware of who your vendors are, and they're aware if they're bad actors. I mean, there are entire websites, entire studies, um, you know, that publish all the time that that hold people to account, and that's why your you all's philosophy of making your suppliers partners is so important. You've all got to recognize what is at stake because whether you like it or not, your suppliers, your partners are part of your brand, yeah. right? You're as responsible for their actions yeah. as they are. Yeah. So I wanted to give one kind of segue of what you're saying and yeah. an event that I was at, it's uh, called the National Minority Supplier Development Council. It was kicked off during the civil rights movement by a few legends in corporate America, uh, Macy's and a couple other Fortune Fives. And it was held here in Atlanta this week, apropos, you know, 40th anniversary in the civil rights movement. Mm. They have a tremendous leader, Adrian Trimble, who comes from Toyota. And before that, a founder of Harriet Michelle, who has been a, a leader. But it's not diversity for diversity's sake. Right. It is the mind of diversity inclusion where people come from different backdrops and are bringing new ideas and focus. And as we said, everything's changing. And I cannot echo. I, I, was, I was there and I was just blown away at the activity, the mind meld, the thought leadership that's there. And so as we say, those companies that understand this and are staying ahead of it and mm-hmm. with their supply chains and their procurement organizations are going to be leading the, the, the movement into the future. Agreed. Yeah. And it's proven. It's not just, of course, it's the right thing to do, but it's proven by every study. McKinsey publishes regularly. I think the last time they published 2017, when leadership teams are diverse at the top, there are str- those are stronger financially performing organizations, right? Folks can innovate more effectively. They can problem solve more effectively because you've got more perspectives, more worldviews in, in the room. And we talked earlier about the cross-functional approach to figuring out if you can land new business. If, if they all think like me or like Greg, Oh, well, you're in really in trouble. Everybody thinks I'm great. <laughs> no, Come on. No, how does anybody know how I think? I'm not sure I even know how. Are, are you going to give him any of that Danish beer now? <laughs> <laughs> but, but kidding on aside, it is, so, <laughs> it is so important, and it's got to be deliberate. And I uh, would love to learn more. So it sounds like y'all spent a good bit of time at the National Minority Supplier Council event this week. It, it was fantastic. All right. Yeah. Jonathan, you, you spent some time there as well this week? Is that uh, one of the reasons you're in town? Uh, actually, I was in town for another reason, uh, visiting my family. But uh, it just so happened that uh, that event was during th- this visit. And I got to meet uh, quite a few people, uh, thought leaders on the subject. And uh, Raj is right. Uh, this is where uh, I think business is headed. We have to have diverse thought. We have to have different people uh, guiding and leading us uh, through change. Mm. Yep, well put. Well, we could we could add just a couple more hours of this conversation. There's so much we can get to, but um, I want to give make sure our listeners, uh, if they enjoy the conversation as much as I have with with uh, Jonathan and, and Raj here, I want to make sure they can they can find y'all. So, Jonathan, how can folks uh, if they if they want to compare notes or pick your brain on anything and, and uh, engage with you? How can folks find you? Hey, I'm pretty active on on LinkedIn. I think that's the best way uh, to find me. So you can just uh, really type my name. Uh, but my 
screen name is uh, Jonathan M. Townsley, so you can find me that way. Uh, and I'd love to continue the conversation about procurement, uh, diversity, uh, innovation. It's, it's really fun and interesting. And, and I will say uh, LinkedIn is such a great tool. Uh, I've connected with many people uh, over the years, uh, and it's actually helped me to, to meet them personally, like uh, Greg today. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And, and I, feel, I felt like I knew you <laughs> already. Right? Well, and, and a quick programming that will include both uh, the gentleman's LinkedIn profile links, make it really easy to tune in. And also with Jonathan, you can go to our YouTube channel and, and check out a, a June webinar where uh, he gave a great presentation that was really, really well received all right Raj how about yourself so I'm local so you just come up to East Cobb meeting no, I was kidding <laughs> <laughs> no but seriously uh, I'm all LinkedIn also but not as I'm, I'm trying to follow with my mentor steps here what Jonathan's doing in LinkedIn but Raj Verma LinkedIn or you can go to my uh, our website or company website and contact us and my uh, marketing team get a hold of me at www.goprocure.com and then finally, um, I have launched a uh, procurement innovation radio that was part of the NMSDC series this week. It's going to be a monthly cool. show. One, 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 I would say partners of yours, uh, Business Radio X yeah. here in Atlanta has asked me to do a show. So that's going to be monthly. We'll be talking about procurement innovation. And I'm going to have to have Greg on to talk about some of those texts now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to cool. bring you on as a guest. Glad to do it. So. Good people, Business Radio X. Uh, they were great distribution partners for us for a couple of years, and and uh, they're doing great work. They they they've been doing podcasting since before podcasting was cool. Was cool, right? <laughs> yeah. Stone, uh, yeah. great great friend of the business. Okay, so and that's exciting too. Monthly series. Is, yeah. is it the same day? That how are you structuring the schedule? So the schedule right now is that it's looking at being third every thir the third Thursday of every month, and to collect to. Our focus is that we'll be having C-suite leaders from not only here in Atlanta, but around. And they're specifically going to talk about innovation within the supply chain of what they're doing. And I'll give, you know, asking them questions and they can take it any way they want. I've been very, you know, it's a bunch of NDAs that you got to sign with these guys yeah. where they're going to go. And then they have the opportunity to doing a webinar series that would follow two weeks later that I'm opening the door to anybody who wants to join in and give whatever questions and answers. The whole thought process there is it, it's a as big as and large as you think of it, it's a very small community yeah. of folks. You know, when you take a look at these procurement organizations, you take a look at uh, ISM, and we all tend to know each other. And if we can get the information out that uh, Jonathan so aptly put out, it's going to be better for everybody. Yeah. Agreed. All right, but no national fans can give. You can't no free webinars for nationals fans, right? No, I don't mind, you know. <laughs> and, and also for the sports fans, you can look me up at uh, southerncollegefootballfrenzy.com, cool. where, where I do my weekly show. You st are you still doing that? Yeah, I'm oh, doing well, outstanding. Show, yeah. Uh, Very cool. And I, and, I do, and I do talk about the Big Ten for the people from the do Midwest good. quite often. Good, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's got to. <laughs> <laughs> well, good stuff. Well, uh, Raj and Jonathan, really enjoy the conversation today. I look forward to having you all back on and, and – and, um, you know, seeing how the, the, this year plays out and, of course, to kick off the 2020. We're excited yeah. about uh, – it's hard to believe. I know it's, it's so cliche, but we're in mid-October. It, yeah. it blows me away. Yeah. Um, but that's – that's where we are. Time so, keeps on ticking. Time keeps on ticking. So on that note, we want to make sure we, as we wrap up today's show, uh, we've got a busy event schedule coming up. Greg. Are we going to do some things? We're going to do a, a couple of things. <laughs> wow. uh, a few things. Um, so first off, if, if you can't find anything that, that you've heard today on the show or on some of these events we're about to share, shoot, shoot us a note to connect at supplychainnowradio.com and we will serve as a resource as best we can. Okay. So, but come check us out in person. We're going to be in Charleston on October 23rd. What are we doing down there? That's uh, next week. So that is uh, Tech Talk, right? S South Carolina competes. I'm, I dare not even try to go with the longer title. <laughs> SCCompetes.org. Uh, bring, yeah, is, is uh, bringing Tech Talk. So we're going to interview some interesting folks there. Get back to Charleston's and go to Magnolia's for dinner. Oh, it's an oh, awesome place. Nice. It's a great place. So that we're looking forward to that. We partnered, like Greg mentioned, with the South Carolina Council on Competitiveness for their SC Logistics Tech Talk event on, to, on September 23rd. You can sign up and st registration still open, uh, sccompetes.org. Then we're headed to Austin with our friends at EFT, which, by the way, yeah. have just expanded. I for Transport, y'all might know this group. Reuters acquired them. Uh, yeah, so the last they're now weeks. part of Reuters events. So um, that's kind Pretty of exciting. kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, not that the, I mean, you know, they're putting together about 300 uh, logistics CIOs down there in Austin, uh, November 7th and 8th, and um, we're going to go down there and help them keep Austin weird. That's right. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and tell tell some stories. Did, <laughs> Raj has got some stories yeah. clearly about keeping Google. Austin weird. Google has a uh, has a chief supply chain officer. So that was a, a really fascinating find to me. I mean, mm. uh, supply chain has made it when yeah. Google has a chief supply yeah. chain officer. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we've already added our first guest. Uh, we're going to be interviewing the chief technology officer of Tire Hub, which is a really interesting uh, modern day collaboration between two huge brands in, yeah. the, in the tire industry. Um, November 7th and 8th, and you can learn more at EFT.com, or you can check out our events, upcoming events tab at SupplyChainRadio.com. Uh, and then as we get through the holidays, uh, CSC and P Atlanta Roundtable in January, the Reverse Logistics Association Conference and Expo in Las Vegas in February, which we're, we're looking forward to that. Right. And then finally, Modex 2020, one of the largest supply chain trade shows in North America. We're going to be broadcasting live all four days. And they're hosting what? They're hosting the Atlanta Supply Chain Awards, by the way. Yes. We just released uh, our new site today and open nominations and registration for the Atlanta Supply Chain Awards 2020, which is March 10th. That's right. Yeah. Right. The, I think that's the second day of Modex, right? It is. This year you had it at Buckhead Club. It yeah, great. we did. Yeah. We're going so a little, we're, bit, little bigger, a little better. A little bigger. And Georgia it, World Congress Center <laughs> bigger. <laughs> 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 Not the whole thing. Yeah. Not the whole thing. Just a room. That's next year. <laughs> yeah. But Jonathan, you were at the event last year yeah. uh, and you know we recognize procurement excellence. Uh, that's really important. And, and we've also added some new awards this year, including categories. Supply Chain Startup of the Year, which we're yeah. excited about. So we'll have to check deadline. I've been out maybe a little too long, but uh, I'm sure there's something we can uh, get go procure in involved with. One of the 17,000 Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, yeah. some, there's, some, there's some tech awards there and some project type awards as well. So. Absolutely. Uh, MC for the event is uh, Sean, uh, uh, Shan Cooper, uh, Executive Director of the Atlanta Committee for Progress. Our keynote is Christian Fisher, President and CEO of Georgia Pacific. Uh, looking forward to that. It's free to attend Modex. You can go to modexshow.com to sign up for that. 35,000 of your closest friends will be there. <laughs> That's right. And the new Atlanta Supply Chain Awards uh, website is yes. at a simple URL, atlantasupplychainawards.com. How did we think of that? Uh, it was your genius for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So really enjoyed the conversation, Raj yeah. and Jonathan. We want to have you all back on. Uh, big thanks to you both, Jonathan Townsley, Raj Verma. Good luck as we close out the year, hopefully on a highly successful note. And we'll be checking back in with you. All right. So, Greg, be sure to check out our events. Check us out. Our interviews, yeah. our replays. Yeah. Uh, you on all it. these places here. <laughs> Any of these if, channels. If you're watching or <laughs> on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple, or YouTube. That's right. Uh, you can also. Or wherever. We, and we make, you know, we make it really easy. I hear they've got websites on, on the World Wide Web these days. So you can yeah. check us out at supplychainradio.com. <laughs> uh, and on behalf of the entire team, uh, we've got one more production day tomorrow. Looking forward to that. But I yep. uh, want to wish everyone a, a great week and a great weekend ahead. And we will see you next time on Supply Chain Radio. Thanks, Go everybody. Blue. Thank you. Go green. War Eagle. <laughs>